I feel really fortunate, incredibly lucky to do what I do, and, and I feel like I've gotten two chances to do it, almost like sort of two careers. Um, my first one, I mean, after all the training and everything, my first one was a little bit of, it's not as dramatic as the sound effects. <laughs> uh, my first one was um, I got to work at the very, very earliest stages of what you might call life software. Um, now, at the time, hardware was really the glamour uh, issue, which was the genes and getting the DNA sequence and finding out where all of that was. And my interest at the time was cancer. I mean, I had studied, as Steve mentioned, developmental biology, and it led to my formulating a hypothesis about cancer that it might involve epigenetics. Not just the genetics, but epigenetics. In other words, not just the hardware of, of the actual genes that make everything go the way they are, which of course is very broken in cancer, but also might be how it's programmed and turning genes on and off might be also important. All I was hoping was that it's somewhat important. I think it's probably equally important. I think everybody agrees with that now. But I got to do that work very early on. I was a fellow in Bert Vogelstein's lab when we made the first discovery of altered DNA methylation in cancer. And the hoopla, you know, was about genes and the hardware, but it was wonderful to be able, uh, maybe because smarter people than me were, were studying the, the hardware, to make a discovery in the software, and then to watch over time how that field has really grown and has become to dominate um, uh, the, uh, it, it's about half of what cancer research is now, but it's starting to, in many ways, dominate a lot of the new um, um, uh, efforts towards um, drug therapy of cancer. And there are some very recent things that are coming out of our lab and other labs like mine that suggest uh, that we might be able to do some very dramatic things indeed, including maybe catching cancer even before you get it. So um, about 10 years ago, when the Genome Project got solved, essentially. And, and David's right, this, um, you know, this issue of we didn't seem to get what we thought we were going to get out of the Genome Project. I mean, you know, there were fewer genes by a fifth. People thought there were 100,000 genes. There were only 20,000, and that's liberal counting. It's anywhere from 17 to 20,000, depending on how you do the arithmetic. And we also thought that it wouldn't be very difficult to find out once you know what the genes are, to look for common differences in that hardware, in that code, and tell who's going to get sick and who's not going to get sick. And that's not worked out quite like that. But from a basic science point of view, the Genome Project has been enormously uh, valuable, and it's given me this second chance to explore in brave new worlds. And in particular, to ask the question, which was unpopular again when I started it about 10 years ago was uh, whether or not the software might help to explain common disease generally. Not just cancer, where it's kind of obvious. You know, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't take a PhD to realize that cancer cells are doing things that normal cells shouldn't do, and so maybe genes are getting turned on and turned off the wrong way. But for common disease, like why does somebody get rheumatoid arthritis, or why do they get diabetes, or why do they get autism, it's a lot more complicated to try and make that argument. And because of the wealth of information that came from the Genome Project, and because I was curious really about this, and because I was in this special environment, and I've been to many places, but I don't know of a place quite like Hopkins, where you have superb clinical scientists, you have mathematicians, statisticians, you have basic structural biologists, like Cynthia Wolberger, my friend and, and associate director of the center. Uh, you have... Um, uh, uh, people who are doing um, engineering and designing, fabricating things. And you don't notice the difference of what department one person's in versus another. It's transparent. Everybody's working towards a common good. And what's happened from doing this, and again, it's been through the support of NIH. I mean, the Genome Institute has been wonderful about supporting epigenetics just like they did genetics. And, and don't take my comments about the Genome Project as critical. I think they're instrumental to absolutely everything I do. But um, they, the, the, we've been able to develop brand new tools to look at the whole structure of the hidden dark genome. I mean, only 1% of your genome is this, is this hardware. The other 99% was thought to be invisible, but we think that a good half of it, at least, is the software code, right? It's not that surprising for the informatics people, right? You have millions of lines of code, but maybe not all that much of a complicated hardware machine. 
And we think a lot of that is what that is, and we're starting to really figure that out. And we've already made a couple of advances that, you know, in the, in the basic area, um, I'll, I'll mention first because this is a basic science um, uh, setting, but, um, you know, we figured out, we found the first evidence for reversible behavior, like how something is one thing and then it turns into something else and what it wants to do and back. And I did the work in honeybees. So, uh, you know, it's wonderful working on honeybees. They have a very small genome. They have interesting behaviors. No one cares about them, the regulatory agencies, because they're a bug. And so you don't get approval. You just do an experiment. It's very nice. Um, and we found meth DNA methylation changes, which is a chemical modification of the, one of those four building blocks of the hardware. But it's like the, he was mentioning the chemical changes that seems to account for whether or not they want to stay at home and take care of the little baby bees or fly around and collect the nectar and pollen and all that. And you can switch them back and forth with this epigenetic machinery. So it's a real advance, I think, for maybe for neuroscience. Um, but in a practical way, we've got some really interesting work about the whole program of programming is disrupted in cancer. And we think that that could lead to some new tests for who's going to develop cancer later it's already actually in trials in England with some success. Um, and we've also got some, some leads on some ways of maybe modifying that programming machinery in cancer for treatment. Um, and then, you know, our really big finding that was very exciting, it was the first time anybody sort of put a piece into that epigenetic puzzle from a whole genome point of view for non-cancer disease was with rheumatoid arthritis. So we found that a way that the genetic hardware collaborates with the programming to put people at risk of getting autoimmune disease and, and how that adds up and what the math of that is and, the, and how you could use it to identify things and we found a new gene that way. Um, so uh, that was a pretty, pretty exciting for us and we're starting to make some real progress on autism, I think. So we had a paper that got some, it was, it made NPR a few weeks ago. I, I, I had one of my co-investigators do that interview, but it was on um, changes in the brain of autistic children and about a third of children uh, in, in this chemical modification. And I, you know, I don't know how it's going to pan out in the long run, but we're hopeful that we'll find more that way. It was a very early study. So there are a number of translational, you know, opportunities. And it just for me, I couldn't imagine the, the more perfect um, job. And, and finally, I just want to say, just in meeting some of you, what a pleasure it is. Uh, so many of you seem to have like a connection that I can relate to. Um, uh, Lewis, I was talking to him about you know his interest in minority education. We were able to start a program for gifted high school students that I've been involved in at, at Hopkins that I've been very excited about. And, and Wilma's actually doing some nucleosome occupancy structure things. And I mean, so many of you have interests that uh, are close to mine. I hope we get a chance to talk some more uh, either now or later uh, or by email. And of course, everybody says, can I have your card? And the absent-minded goofball professor I am, I say, well, no. <laughs> but I'm sure Audrey will tell me how to get one of those. So anyway, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for, for coming. And I'd love to talk to you. Thank you.